you'll have an opportunity to speak at a later point in the debate. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we just heard was, was a motion moved Order. by a shadow, the shadow treasurer who couldn't sustain the debate. It was the limpest, that was the limpest performance one has ever, ever seen. He could, five, seven minutes into the speech, he couldn't sustain it. He couldn't sustain the speech. It was like being flogged with a warm lettuce. <laughs> flogged with a warm lettuce. As he got up, you know, mauled, mauled by a dead sheep. Mauled by a dead sheep. And, 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 and the height of him, he's, the height of him was, his last point is, where is your fiscal responsibility? This is a government which has taken a 7 per cent deficit on the public sector borrowing requirement and turned it into a surplus of 1.25 per cent and cut outlays by 7 per cent of GDP, and he's got the gall to ask us, where is our fiscal responsibility? When you went to the last election with your former leader offering $7.8 billion worth of unfunded tax cuts. And we went with a $400 million package which was fully paid for. And you're talking about where is the fiscal responsibility. And, and, and the goal of your last week saying that you would have a fiscal policy which was lower than ours as a proportion of GDP. That is, absconding with all of our work over seven years, all those months in those expenditure review committee meetings, cutting down public outlays from nearly 31 per cent of GDP to 23 and copying your criticism for nearly every one of them, one after the other, for nearly every one of them, and then you know, finally we bring down a budget with outlays to GDP just above 22 per cent in a year or two's time, and you'll say you'll knock 140 million off, off it all, and it's all yours. As I said, it's like, it's like we built the structure of fiscal policy, as I said, it's like building the Empire State Building, and then you jumping in the lift and running to the top and putting a brick on top and saying, look what I've built. Look what I've built. I mean, it's a joke. You talking, you talking about fiscal responsibility. But then, as I said today, in talking about, in talking about economic policy, in talking about economic policy, uh, in talking about economic policy, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because uh, he, he said, we are well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for the member was heard in silence, and we expect the same treatment. Order. Order. Mr. The Dep member for North Mr. Sydney. Mr. The member for North Sydney. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and then, and then last week we have the shadow treasurer saying we are moving across the board into my different sort of world, and I'm asking you to accept the fact. Imagine if I stood up as treasurer in this country and said, "Well, look, economic policy is now going to be conducted in a different world, a different kind of world." I mean, the press would beat me to a pulp. Order. The member for Wentworth. The press would beat me to a pulp, and they'd be entitled to. And here you are saying, I'm moving, but look, we're not going to have any rising unemployment. We're going to have a weak fiscal policy, a wage mayhem with enterprise bargaining, sole reliance on monetary policy, but we're not going to have any higher unemployment because we're moving into a different kind of world. He said, if you move decisively and quickly enough, you don't have any significant employment effects. I mean, what twaddle? I mean, as if anyone with any self respect with a view about economics would put that kind of stuff across and hope to get away with it and hope to get away with it as i said you go back to the action plan what's the key line by reducing inflation and shifting the weight off monetary policy how do you reduce inflation and shift the weight off monetary policy you say by cutting wages but how do you cut wages without monetary policy oh you'll cut them because you've got enterprise bargaining Order, the member for i mean what 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 an unbelievably sick joke that is. What a sick joke that is. And that's the central tenet. You're not prepared to defend the central tenet of your policy. You run away from it, the and when some questioner interject. puts a question to you, but won't this have employment effects? Oh, I'm living in a different sort of world. Not the world of economics like everyone else has to live in. A different kind of world. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable stuff. And uh, to think you could parrot this and then get away with it shows and either an arrogance or naivety, one or the other, arrogance or naivety, that you could parrot this kind of rubbish and hope to get away. That's why they were laughing at you at the Metal Trades Industry Association. Here they are. What did the chairman say when he got up? We don't want toe-to-toe -to -toe industrial contests, he said. We, don't. we want a mature industrial structure where we get a change in the craft structure by evolution. 
through such things as award restructuring. And who is the industry body putting the big effort into the award restructuring? The Metal Trades Industry Association. And they all know what enterprise bargaining means for them. It means they get cut to ribbons. They were in the eye of the storm. The people sitting on the top table the other night were in the eye of the storm in 1980-81. People like Bert Evans, who watched these industries consigned to the scrap heap under your wages policy. And you're back there with the same policy. And the three of you are there. As I said, the tragic trio. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the member for Wentworth, the, men, the member for, for Benelong, and Senator Stone. The three people who've already destroyed the economy once and want a return bout. They want to come back and have a second go. With the, but, but, but you wouldn't mind if they said, well, we've used seven years to think, we've used seven years to think about our structure. We'll have something different. Oh, no, no thinking. Adopt the government's fiscal policy, adopt all of its deregulation, adopt its structure, and what we'll do is we'll have the same policy, enterprise bargaining, kid the craft structure doesn't exist, let the wages, wage mayhem start, and we'll bring interest rates down on them and give Australia a recession, because that's what it really needs. It'll cut the import growth and lower the inflation rate. I mean, that's your dull policy. That's the, that's the bankruptcy of you. You have nothing in terms of any creativity or ingenuity. You have nothing as a party or as individuals. No, look, no party in the world would see done to a country what you three did to Australia and then have the front to propose you again to manage the economy. Would have the front. I mean, anyone in American politics who did this would be drummed from the regiment. They'd never appear again. Anyone in British politics who, uh, who, who sent the British economy into a recession and the, and the rest would never appear again. Oh, no. But here you're back again, large as life, cocky as you like. We can do it all again. Do it all again. And what do you propose in your policy? Order the member for Farrow. What do you propose in your policy? A set of tax, basically a set of, uh, a set of bribes, a set of bribes, and then a set of giveaways, the most outrageous of which is, of course, the capital gains tax. The most outrageous of which is the capital gains tax. You can't even keep together the basic fabric of the structure that the government's put in place. We've done the hard work and put the capital gains tax in place. We've taken the political risks and put it there. You just don't have the decency or the common sense to understand that something of value has been done and it should be preserved. I oh, know, because you think you can give the one per cent of the taxpaying public tens of billions of accumulated contingent tax liabilities sitting there. You think you can hand them over. As I said, it's not public. It's not the legitimate operation of a party thinking about better, a better policy structure and a proposal for a change in public policy. That's public theft. It's a proposal for public theft. That's what it is. And it is on that basis, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I want to move this amendment to put some real substance in the debate. That all words after that be omitted and the following words inserted. This House notes the widespread criticism of the proposal of the Leader of the Opposition to abolish the capital gains tax and in particular the disastrous consequences for the economic health of the nation of the proposal. Consequently, this House believes the Leader of the Opposition must provide the public with a detailed account of one, what prompted the Opposition to backdate its proposed concession respecting the gains tax on the 19th of September to the 19th of September 1985, on what basis has the Opposition calculated that the revenue cost of their proposal would be $450 million a year, and to what extent does this costing include an allowance for the realisation of windfall tax-free gains? derived from the backdating of the coalition's proposal? To what extent does the opposition costing make allowance for increased tax avoidance, the potential of which was described by the business commentator Terry McCran in the Melbourne Sunday Herald of the 29th of October 1989? Four, to what extent does the president of the Liberal Party and chairman of Elders IXL, Mr John Elliott, benefit from the opposition's proposed change to the capital gains tax? To what extent does the Liberal Party candidate for Barker and Director of Elders IXL, Mr Ian McLaughlin, benefit from the opposition's proposed changes to the capital gains tax? In, in the discussions that took place between Mr Elliott and the Leader of the Opposition prior to the latter's challenge for the leadership of the Liberal Party, what discussion was there of the opposition's proposed changes to the capital gains tax? Similarly, similarly and I want you to listen to this. What discussions, correspondence or other communication have taken place between the shadow treasurer or his office and Mr Elliott or his advisers on the structure of the opposition capital gains tax proposal? What prompted the Leader of the Opposition to tell the Metal Trades Industry Association that countless millions of taxpayers pay capital gains tax 
when statistics of the ATO show that less than 1 per cent of individual taxpayers paid capital gains tax in respect of the 87 8 income year. Similarly, what has prompted Leader of the Opposition to claim that his proposal to help small business when his, his is a proposal to help small business when more than two thirds of the capital gains tax payable by companies is paid the largest one and a half per cent of Australian companies. Is it opposition policy, as stated by the Leader of the National Party to APIA last week, that exploration farm out agreements will be exempt from the opposition's so called speculative gains tax? Why was this exemption not included in the opposition's so called economic action plan? What other exemptions from the speculative gains tax proposal has the opposition agreed to? But not detailed in its economic action plan. What is the revenue cost of these exemptions? Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we believe that uh, the motion, the amendment, calls on the leader of the opposition to provide a, the public with a detailed account of those questions, mm -hmm. and particularly account of the questions about what relationship, the, the, what discussions, correspondence, or other communications have taken place between the shadow treasurer or his office, and Mr. Elliott or his advisers on the structure of the opposition's capital gains tax proposal, particularly around the Harlan proposal. Tell us about the relationships and the questions about, no, we're not. I know that Elliot was in touch with your office about Harlan. I know he was. Was in touch with your office about the structure of your proposal, because Harlan doesn't succeed unless you go back to September 1985. Harlan does not succeed in terms of capital gains treatment unless you go back to September 1985. Tell us. Let the opposition tell us about whether, in his discussions with uh, Mr Elliott prior to his change in leadership, was the capital gains tax issue discussed and the back dating to September 1985. Tell us these things and let us see what veracity there is in your claim that this is just a change in public policy, when it is in fact a proposal for the largest transfer of wealth of the public's contingent capital gains tax liability of taxpayers to the Commonwealth in the nation's history. And let's get a real issue on the table of the House of Representatives and not some phony proposition proposed by you about fiscal responsibility when you in fact bequeath to us the most disastrous fiscal inheritance in the nation's history. And I wouldn't be bothered tabling once again the, the then Secretary of the Treasury's note saying that the speed of the fiscal deterioration in Australia is unparalleled in the post-war years. Or if I, my memory serves me correctly, it might have said unparalleled in our peacetime history. Because that's what he said in the note which was given to the then Treasurer uh, before, before the election of 1983. The fastest deterioration in fiscal policy ever. And who was left to clean it up? This government. But you got the temerity to come in today and say, uh, because my colleague, the Minister for Social Security, to, refers to the wage tax trade-off of this year, which is of course the successful plugging of a wage explosion, and, he, and, and him speculating about the prospect of such, a, of such an economic technique being employed again, to infer that the government would then have uh, some kind of irresponsible fiscal policy, when in fact the very wage tax trade-off that the government did introduce on the 1st of July did succeed in plugging a wage explosion. And that's why we'll have wages growth of six and a half to six and three quarter per cent this year, instead of about 15 per cent, which we would have had under you, and which would then have been followed by a crash landing, a recession. It did work, and despite the cynicism that it was greeted with as election ploys and the rest, it was a necessary part of economic policy. And the government will make judgments in the future about what is required in terms of wages and fiscal policy. But as I said the other day, the requirements of fiscal policy will be paramount. That is, the question of demand will be paramount and the government's stance on fiscal policy for the coming year will be determined in the coming year and all other judgments made contingent upon that requirement, a requirement of a, of a reduction in demand. And so, Mr Deputy Speaker, the whole proposition is fraudulent. It's without any basis, but I want the Shadow Treasurer to face up to his claim about his different world and to tell Order. us what kind of world he believes Order, will exist. Wentworth. What kind of different world exonerates him from the laws of economics? What kind of different world frees him of the laws of economics and the behaviour of economic, of economic aggregates and economic Order. variables? Let him tell us that, because if any one of the rest of us said something like that, we'd be beaten to a pulp by the media of this country, as you deserve to be. The original